Hello and welcome. This is a presentation about the practice of intensive rotational grazing that was delivered at Eco Farm Day in Cornwall, Ontario on the 23rd of February in 2013. My name is Paul Slump and I am the farmer behind Grazing Days. We graze 40 animals each year and sell the beef from those animals to about 250 households in the Ottawa area. Although the practice of intensive rotational grazing is quite lucrative, since we can rely on livestock to feed themselves and spread their own manure, and we don't carry any of the machinery and fuel costs related to bringing feed to cows and manure to the fields, and although grazing livestock intensively is a low stress and enjoyable way of working with livestock, I will not touch on these components of grazing in today's presentation. Today's presentation will focus on how intensive rotational grazing works. The thinking behind intensive rotational grazing and holistic resource management was really developed by this man. His name is Alan Savory. Alan grew up in Africa, in Zimbabwe in particular, where shortly after he finished his studies, he started working as a research biologist and park ranger in Zimbabwe's national parks and game reserves. One of the main problems they were facing in the parks in Zimbabwe at the time was desertification the encroachment of desert into vegetative areas. Allen set out to discover why this desertification was happening and made it his personal mission to rehabilitate parks and to revegetate the desert. As you can see in these pictures, he managed to figure out how. The conventional wisdom at the time was that the grasslands growing close to the desert were easily destroyed by having too many grazing animals on those vulnerable grasses. The re remedy to maintaining grasslands was to decrease the number of grazing animals per acre. Allen and his team tried decreasing the numbers of grazing animals in the game reserves, but the deserts continued to encroach. Allen wanted to discover why. He started observing grazing herds in their natural environment, like this herd of wildebeests in Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, Africa. The first thing he observed was that these grazing herds were huge and consisted of many animals. He observed that these herds follow huge migration patterns and that the herd only grazed in each location at one point during the year, and that they grazed elsewhere during the rest of the year, as can be seen on this migration map. He observed that nature's predators, such as lions, but also humans, play an important role in forcing these grazing herds to follow their migration patterns. He reasoned that removing humans as hunters or predators from national parks and game reserves would have implications on migratory patterns of these grazing herds. He also reasoned that divvying up land into small plots, be it private farms or small national parks, would make it difficult for these herds to follow natural migration patterns. He observed that if grazing animals do not migrate, but instead graze specific grasslands continuously, they tend to graze the grass species that they like time and time again, and never graze the species that they don't like. He reasoned that certain plants in a continuously grazed grassland would become overgrazed, and other species would be overrested. This can be seen in this pasture where the horse has overgrazed most of the grasses in this field, but hasn't touched some of the less palatable plants and wooded species that you can see here. And here. In this picture, you can see how the right side of the fence, the grasses have been evenly clipped and rested while the grasses on the left side of the fence have been continuously grazed and few grasses remain and more wooded and less palatable species have started to take over the pasture.
Alan Savory realized that in order to stop the encroachment of the desert, that it was not so much the stocking density or how many grazing animals were present in the national parks, but how they migrated around the park, ensuring that each grass plant had the opportunity to recover from the previous grazing before it would be grazed again. Grazing timing was the key factor, not grazing numbers. Indeed, what we are trying to accomplish in intensive rotational grazing on our farms is to mimic the natural migration patterns of grazing herds on the grasslands that we manage on our farms. In order to better understand how this all works, we are going to talk about grass, healthy soils, the role of grazing ruminants, and the role of hooves in particular. In order to understand how grass grows, we need to imagine the soil surface as a mirror. A grass, as grass produces green foliage that grows upward, simultaneously roots are growing downwards. When that grass is clipped or eaten, the energy that is stored in the grass's roots get absorbed and used to generate new shoots of grass. These new shoots of grass will then grow to a point where they start again producing energy through photosynthesis that they can send down for new root growth. These new shoots of grass, however, are full of sugary goodness and they taste very sweet and grazing animals really like them. They are like candy. So if after a grazing or clipping, the grass uses its root reserve to produce a new shoot of grass and that new shoot of grass is grazed or clipped again, there is very little root reserve left for the plant to use to generate a new shoot of grass. The plant still looks green, but essentially goes dormant. This is what we call overgrazing. This is the process that we see in this graph. The grass is, cl is clipped on the right, and the roots use their energy reserves to produce new leaf growth. This graph indicates that after each clipping or grazing, the energy reserves available in the roots take longer to recover than the foliage growing above the ground does. The second process that we need to be aware of in grass is that biologically, grass has reached its goal in the season if it has gone to seed. Most grasses are programmed to do this prior to the longest day of the year and will simply hang around for the remainder of the growing season if they are not clipped or grazed. The next thing we need to understand is the role that healthy soils play in our grazing systems. Our soils are stocked full of microorganisms that are the workforce behind the communication and transportation infrastructure in our soils. These little guys are the ones who make sure the roots of our plants receive the nutrients, the air, and the water necessary for the plant to function well. In order for us to make sure that we have healthy grasses in our pastures, we need to make sure that our soil microorganisms are healthy, diverse, and strong. There are two main things that we can do to ensure a healthy soil microbiology. First, we need to make sure that the photosynthesis process is working well, that the plants on the soil surface are able to convert energy from the sun and move some of that excess energy into the roots and into the soil itself for the microbiology to use. Note that the photosynthesis process only works well in plants that are not overgrazed. Secondly, we need to make sure that we do not expose these microorganisms to the elements. These microorganisms are very well protected in their natural habitat and have a difficult time surviving exposure to the sun, rain, and wind or rapid fluctuations in temperature. I liken the tilling of soil to a tornado ripping through a village. If a tornado rips through a village, all the transportation and communication infrastructure will be destroyed. The villagers will most likely rebuild that infrastructure and continue on with their life. 
If, however, a tornado rips through the village once a year, or worse, two or three times a year, for 20 years in a row, many of the people living in that village will die or choose not to rebuild and leave. And so it is for the microorganisms in our soils. We need to protect them so that they continue to offer transportation and communication services to our plants. For these reasons, Tony McQuail, a holistic resource management trainer, refers to exposed soil as public enemy number one. A healthy soil with an active population of microorganisms does three things very well. First, it ensures that the soil is storing carbon and building up organic matter. As we talked about a few minutes ago, each time grasses are trimmed or grazed, they use the energy stored in their roots to produce a new shoot of growth above the surface. As the grass begins to grow again, however, it grows new roots. The old roots dry up and become the carbon stored in the soil. On a quick side note, although top mulching or adding plant foliage to the soil does add short-term carbon to the soil, these are highly unstable forms of carbon and are used up and rotted very quickly. It is like feeding the soil empty sugar calories. The most stable form of carbon comes from the growing and regrowing of plant roots. The second function of healthy soil with active microorganisms is the transportation of water away from and towards the plant roots. In this process of growing and regrowing roots, capillaries form in the soil where old roots have dried up and turned to carbon. These capillaries turn the top layer of soil into a giant sponge that can absorb, store, and wick away a lot of water very quickly. Only in extreme circumstances would you ever see the pooling of water on top of a field that has healthy soils with an active population of microorganisms. The pooling of water in this picture shows that these soils are poorly managed. The third major factor in healthy soils is the cycling of nutrients and making them available for plants to use. This soil cross-section shows how a diversity of plants growing in the same area tap into different sources of nutrients in the same soil. Deep-rooted and shallow-rooted plants are each bringing nutrients from different locations in the soil to the soil surface, where they will either be grazed or rot and release those nutrients to be used by the next generation of plants. Ruminants are key to this system because they ensure grasses continue to grow and establish new roots and they speed up the nutrient cycle. The first role that ruminants play in our system is grass growth management. In a previous slide, I talked about grasses being programmed to want to go to seed. Once they have gone to seed, they have reached their goal for the season. Ruminants invigorate grass growth by eating and removing the older generation of grasses and allowing sunlight to shine on and stimulate the growth and photosynthesis in the next generation of grasses. The second role that ruminants play is by aiding and speeding up the cycling of nutrients. Plant matter left on the soil surface takes some time to rot and decay before they release those nutrients for the next generation of plants. A cow rumen, though, is able to break down that plant matter quite quickly and is able to release those nutrients to be in a usable form to the next generation of plants in a matter of days. Also, research has shown that ruminants grazing in a pasture intensively will hit every square inch of soil with dung or urine over the course of the grazing season and are far more efficient at spreading nutrients than we would ever be able to do with mechanical manure spreaders. Finally, two-toed hooves play an important role in maintaining healthy grass systems. 
Hooves play an important role in trampling down grasses and vegetation that are not eaten, especially when there are many hooves in a small area trampling down grasses at the same time. This, like ruminants eating the older generation of grasses, exposes the new generation of grasses to sunlight to allow them to grow. It ensures that pastures will grow back evenly for the next grazing. The hooves of ruminants are also great at distributing the top layers of soil. Often, after it rains, a small crust will form on the top of exposed soil, making it very difficult for newly sprouting seeds to penetrate and expose themselves to sunlight. Hooves are great at dis disturbing and, and breaking down this crust of topsoil. The seed of some grass varieties only germinate when they have been exposed to the pressure of a hoof. Other grasses asexually reproduce when the pressure put on them by a cow hoof forces them to produce growth towards the sides rather than straight up. This results in a thicker grass mat and a better protected soil. When I observe the cow footprints on my farm, especially after wet days, the sides of these footprints are teeming with new grass seedlings. The indentation caused by hooves of ruminants also create great microclimates for grasses to establish themselves in. These hoof prints offer protection from the wind, water pools inside them, and are a little bit warmer than the surrounding area. As you can see in this picture, taken in the spring, these hoof print, this hoof print offered just enough protection from the frost for the grasses to start growing, while the surrounding grasses we're still waiting for warmer weather. Finally, hooves play an important role in breaking up and kicking around older dung, assisting in its further decay and nutrient release to the soil. Now that we have a better grasp of what is at play, are you ready to turn desert into grassland? Or at the very least, manage the grasses on your farm in a way that ensures healthy plants, soil, and livestock? In order to help us start planning our intensive rotational grazing system or planning the migration of our herd over our land, we must be sure that we meet all the needs of our ruminants wherever they are on the property. In the summer, cattle need three things, water, grass, and salt and minerals. This is an aerial photograph of the farm that I manage just south of Ottawa in Manatick Station. This photograph comes from Google and was taken two years prior to when I started managing it. As my partner points out, it looks far greener now and the cornfields on the left side of the farm have been seeded to grass, something that sounds like I'm swimming against the current these days. This farm consists of 65 acres of pasture. The first thing I needed to make sure of is that there is access to water. The straight blue lines represent drainage ditches which contain water that I suspect are contaminated with fertilizer and pesticide runoff. The blue circles, three of them, indicate ponds that are full of groundwater. All of these waterways are fenced off with electric fence and the cows access the water out of these ponds using cow powered nose pumps or pasture pumps. The next thing I needed to lay out was a way for the cattle to move from wherever they were grazing to get to the water source. The red lines indicate the laneways that I have laid out and fenced on my farm that allow cattle to get to water without having to walk through pastures they have already grazed or that I would like them to graze in several weeks time. Next, I laid out my permanent fences these fences are single-strand high tensile electric fence. 
These fences provide a psychological barrier to the animals, not a physical barrier. Getting an electric shock is unpleasant, and the cattle will avoid it if they can. As long as the cattle have access to enough feed, water, salt, and minerals, they will not test this fence. I have 12 different paddocks on my 65 acres, and I aim to graze each one once every 45 to 60 days. When I am ready to start grazing a pasture, I put up a temporary fence to give the cattle access to how much grass I, th grass I think they will graze in a day, and give them access to a laneway that will help them reach the closest water source. This picture shows grazing day number one in this paddock. Each day, I put up a new temporary fence ahead of the cattle to give them access to a new pasture and put up a back fence behind the cattle to prevent them from going back to where they have already grazed. This picture shows grazing day number six in this paddock. As you can see from the green line in the pasture, I also use my back temporary fence to make a laneway to the permanent laneway, which will give the cattle access to water. I set up these long and narrow paddocks when I was grazing 40, 14 cattle and I needed a way to create a small enough pasture for intensive grazing effects. I need to lay out a temporary laneway for the cattle to get back to the permanent laneway. This is quite inefficient and I would do it differently if I had to do it again. A better example of layout can be seen in this picture. This is day one of grazing in this pasture that used to be cornfield. I set up a fence in front of the cattle to prevent them from venturing into the grasses that they will be eating later in the week. And I opened the gate to give them access to water. This is day number nine in the same pasture. I set up a new fence ahead of the cattle to give them fresh grass to eat, and I set up a new back fence to prevent them from going back to where they have already grazed. I opened up a new gate in the permanent laneway back to the water source, and Bob's your uncle. I didn't have to worry about temporary laneways at all. When deciding how many animals you would like to graze on your property, what kinds of grasses you would like them to graze, and how often you would like to move them, you need to ask yourself what your purpose is of grazing these animals. Grazing animals for dairy requires a different way of grazing than grazing cow-calf pears, which in turn requires a different kind of grazing than grazing finishing meats, steers, or heifers. If you are grazing animals to change the landscape, such as using goats to clear brush, as in the picture on the top right corner of this slide, the grazing would look slightly different again. If we look at the nutrient requirements for growing beef cattle, as shown in this slide, we see that the amount of dry matter intake remains relatively constant for different daily gains. In other words, the quantity of pasture intake does not determine how much weight your animals are going to gain. What does impact the weights that your animals gain is the quality of grass that they are eating. The higher the total digestible nutrients, the higher the protein, the calcium, and the phosphorus intake, the more weight our animals will gain. This means that we need to understand what is happening to the quality of the grass in our pastures. This infographic shows that the grass quality is highest when the grasses are young and that all of the nutrients and protein are tied up in the grass seed as the grass goes to seed. It also shows that the total forage available for grazing is far greater the closer the grass comes to going to seed. Where the two lines intersect, you get the most nutrients at a decent yield, 
This is the prime time to graze your cattle, when the grasses in your pasture are about to flower and go to seed. It is also the best time to make quality hay. The same nutrient requirements for weight gain exist in animals eating hay. To graze dairy animals, I want a little more quality and might graze my animals slightly before the intersection of the two lines. For grazing cow-calf pairs, yield is a little more important than quality and I might graze my animals slightly after the intersection of these two lines. For finishing beef cattle, I would aim to graze my animals right at the intersection of these two lines. As I'm rotating my animals, I want to time it so that for the next grazing my animals are eating only grasses in the zone where the quality and yield intersect. With my grazing, I am constantly prepping pastures to be at their top quality and yield stage six to eight weeks from now when my cattle will be in the pasture again. The time of year also plays an important role in the nutrients that are available in the pasture. This graph shows that grass quality is at its highest in the beginning and in the end of the season, with a dip in quality around the longest day of the year when grasses are programmed to go to seed, and a continued lull in quality during the hottest part of the summer. This graph shows the quantity of grass that is available and, and growing during the different parts of the year. We can see that there is a lot of grass growth prior to the longest day of the year, and then grass grow drops off during the hottest months of the summer to pick up slightly in the fall. Depending on what climate you are grazing cattle in, this curve might look slightly different. What we end up is, is this, with is this graph. This graph shows the total available nutrients that are accessible to livestock from the pastures at different points in the year. The large number of nutrients available in the spring really assist frame growth, and the upswing in nutrients that are available in the fall facilitate finishing weight gain. What is interesting to note is that in May and June, you have almost twice as many nutrients available in your pastures as you do in late July, August, and early September. This means that you only need about half the pasture in May and June as you would need in late July and August to feed the same amount of animals. This means that during my first rotation, I can either speed up my grazing rotation so that I finish the rotation in four weeks instead of six to eight weeks, or I can choose to not graze certain pastures and clip them to maintain quality for my next rotation, or I can harvest hay from those pastures in the first rotation. In the second and third rotation, I will need to graze all of the pastures. Two interesting side effects of intensive rotational grazing this past year in Ontario in relation to the drought that we experienced was that first, since I was constantly grazing my animals with the pasture availability for the next eight weeks in mind, I knew that my pastures were not recovering as fast as they, as they should be about six weeks before I ran out of grass. As insurance, I decided to purchase hay just in case the situation did not change. I ended up buying hay at the end of June for $20 per 400 pound round bale. One month later, when everyone else realized they were short of feed, those same bales would have cost me well over $80 per bale. Secondly, because the grasses in my pasture were healthy, had plenty of root reserve energy, and were growing in a sponge-like topsoil able to absorb lots of water, and the only stress that they were facing was the lack of water, as soon as it started to rain, the pastures rebounded very quickly. By the third week of August, two weeks after a significant rainfall, my pastures had enough grass in them to see me through to the end of the year.
The last thing to consider is the time of day in which you choose to move your animals. This infographic shows the amount of carbohydrate that exists in the plants at different times during the day. While the sun is shining, plants photosynthesize and produce carbohydrates. In order to stay alive, plants respirate and use some of these carbohydrates. During the night, plants will use a fair amount of carbohydrates to stay alive. Then, when plants start photosynthesizing in the morning, they first replenish the carbohydrates that were used up during the night, and then they start generating new carbohydrates that will be put towards plant growth. It is best to move livestock onto, onto grasses that have already replenished the carbohydrates they used the night before to stay alive. As a result, I only move my cattle starting after noon. Finally, I would highly recommend using low-stress animal handling facilities on your farm. Dr. Temple Grandin has a number of designs available for free on her website. You have worked hard all summer to produce the best animals you can. If you are shipping these animals to an abattoir, the adrenaline released during stressful situations negatively affects the quality of the meat. If you are shipping these animals to a sale barn, stress will for these animals to shit, meaning that they will weigh less by the time they go over the scales at the sale barn. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it, and please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions or would like any clarification. Thank you very much.